Last summer, just months after the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action, the dean of Howard University's medical school received a letter from a conservative legal group that said, quote, in accordance with the Supreme Court decisions in Students for Fair Admissions, Inc., your medical school must immediately cease any and all policies, practices, programs, or procedures that include a racial component, end quote. Here's a conservative group telling Howard University that it may be breaking the law by prioritizing black students in their admission practices. Howard University is one of the nation's most well-known historically black colleges and universities. In order to get the full picture, it's important to understand the context and the historical uh, evidence for it. After the Civil War, Congress passed an act to establish the Freedmen's Bureau, which sought to provide resources to displaced Southerners, including recently freed black Americans. Now, intrinsic in its foundation was the idea that after the abolition of slavery, it was the responsibility of Congress to right the wrongs of our nation's ugly past. The Freedmen's Bureau was intended to address the welfare of black Americans, not based on their race or their skin color, but on their condition. It is very much the language of reparations. One senator urged in 1866 that the people of the southern states should, quote, be as zealous and active in the passage of laws and the inauguration of measures to elevate, develop, and improve the Negro as they have hitherto been to enslave and degrade him, end quote. Fast forward 100 years through a century of segregation, persecution, and systemic oppression. The civil rights movement brought with it progressive activists who promoted the idea that in order to truly achieve an equal and colorblind society, we must adopt race-conscious policies to address the centuries of oppression and the disadvantages that black folks continue to face that are baked into our society. In a commencement speech at Howard University in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson said this. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. This is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. Well, then came Ronald Reagan. And as Reagan rose to political prominence throughout the 1970s, he introduced into our national lexicon the idea of, quote, reverse discrimination, end quote. He argued against race conscience policies, against affirmative action, against hiring policies that valued diversity, even claiming that these practices were, quote, a form of racism, end quote. In 1978, the Supreme Court took up a challenge to affirmative action brought by a white man who didn't get into the medical school of his choice. The court ruled in his favor. In her recent essay for the New York Times magazine, Nicole Hannah-Jones argues that in this case, quote, the court was legally and ideologically severing the link between race and condition. Race became nothing more than ancestry and a collection of superficial physical traits. The 14th Amendment was no longer about alleviating the extraordinary repercussions of slavery, but about treating everyone the same regardless of their skin color, history, or present condition, end quote. Hannah Jones argues that for more than 50 years, there has been an organized effort to stall and even undo civil rights era efforts to advance racial progress. The end of affirmative action is another symptom of that backlash against racial progress. For more on this, I'm joined by Nicole Hannah-Jones herself. She is a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter at the New York Times Magazine. She is the creator of the 1619 Project. She is the founding director of the Center for Journalism and Democracy at Howard University and is the school's night chair in race and journalism. Uh, Professor, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Um, we've, we've tried to lay out some of this. It's a very, very... Uh, long and, and, and well-written uh, essay, but in it you lay out a question that is central to our nation's handling of race 
and repair. You write, quote, how does a white majority nation, which is which for nearly its entire history wielded race conscious policies and laws that oppressed and excluded black Americans, create a society in which race no longer matters? Do we ignore race in order to eliminate its power or do we consciously use race to undo its harms? I'll ask you to, to say more about that. Yes, well, one, thank you so much for that introduction and for having me on the show. Um, so I think what I'm trying to get at in that sentence is the fundamental tension that we've had in America in a society that, as I said, had 250 years of racial slavery, where uh, people who were uh, designated as Black because they had some semblance of African ancestry uh, were enslaved and enslavable. And then we follow that by 100 years of racial apartheid, where, again, people who were deemed to have any African ancestry whatsoever were deemed as not having the same legal rights of citizenship as uh, other Americans. And so we now, with the civil rights movement, of course, have this idea that the Constitution is colorblind. And that was really an idea put forth by progressives to say the Constitution doesn't allow you to treat uh, citizens differently in a harmful way based on race, but with the understanding that if you separated, segregated, subordinated a race of people for 350 years um, and used race to do that, that you can't just simply one day say, okay, race doesn't matter for you, that you actually have to counterbalance with race conscious policies to bring black people up a long history of race conscious policies used to hold black people down. So there's it, the thesis. It actually seems like a simple yep, idea. So you've laid out the thesis. Saying, Go ahead, Ali. You've laid out the thesis, and and uh, what you've talked about as well. And I'll read this from the from the essay. You you've discussed that conservative groups have spent the nine months since the affirmative action ruling launching an assault on programs designed to explicitly address racial inequality across American life. They filled a, filed a flurry of legal challenges and threatened lawsuits against race conscious programs outside the realm of education, including diversity fellowships at law firms, a federal program to aid disadvantaged small business and a program to keep black women from dying in childbirth. These conservative groups whose name often evoke fairness and freedom of rights are using civil rights law to claim that the Constitution requires colorblindness and that efforts targeted at ameliorating the suffering of descendants of slavery illegally discriminate against white people. They're, 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 as, I, as you just mentioned, they're reversing the, the paradigm to again favor white people in America. Absolutely. And we began to see this co-opting of the language of colorblindness or the rhetoric of colorblindness really right at the moment that Black people gained their full uh, civil rights um, in the late 1960s. So the same people who um, said that race should matter in everything, where you can live, where you can go to school, what jobs you can have, um, once you can no longer use race to harm Black people, say, oh, well, actually, we can't use race to help Black people either. And they began to really take on this language of colorblindness and use for instance, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, the 14th Amendment, both laws that were passed um, to eliminate the subordination of Black Americans, they begin to use those laws against programs that are trying to bring Black Americans into the mainstream. And kind of its most perverse manifestation is that letter to Howard University that you opened with. Because what they're saying is, not only uh, are we saying the Constitution prohibits predominantly white organizations from using race to help black people. But we are now going to prohibit black people from helping themselves. And that is a very dangerous uh, place for us to be in in America. Uh, obviously, the work you do, Nicole, is to write these things for the rest of us to read and, and, and hopefully discuss. But this sounds like something that requires uh, a, an urgent remedy. And the remedy would start with most Americans understanding what you've laid out here, that this is a concerted calculated long-term effort to undo the progress that black people have made in this country and that, and that society has made. What does the answer look like? What does success look like in pushing back on this? That's exactly right, um, Ali. This is why I wanted to write this piece, because we now recognize that there was a 50-year strategic, long-game effort to overturn Roe and Dobbs, and that we have suddenly seen half of our population lose the constitutional right that we once had. But I think we've largely failed to see that there was a parallel racial strategy occurring at the same time to really eliminate any remedies uh, to help Black Americans overcome the legacy of slavery. So, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with a remedy when you have a 
Supreme Court that isn't actually following precedent, that isn't that concerned uh, with what is the context of the 14th Amendment and the history of the 14th Amendment. But what I'm arguing is that we have to go back to what we did during the Freedmen's Bureau, which the Freedmen's Bureau's policies were not just about race. They were about alleviating the condition of people whose lineage meant their ancestors had been enslaved or they had been enslaved. And I think we have to go back to something like that. Affirmative action originally was not this kind of catch-all diversity program. As conceived, it was a program to help people whose ancestors had been enslaved come into all of the areas of American life where they had been excluded. So I'm arguing that we change our lexicon, that we focus on uh, building programs for descendants of slavery, lineage-based programs, um, but also that we just wake up and understand that um, if we maintain this level of racial inequality, it actually is impossible to do so and maintain our democracy at the same time. There's a reason we see uh, all of this anti-democratic policies and anti-democratic actions happening at a time of great racial polarization. Mm -hmm. Racial inequality requires constant suppression. We cannot have a society where Black Americans are not allowed uh, to move forward and to overcome and also have our democracy at the same time. Nicole, thank you, as always, for being with us, and thank you for this uh, wonderful essay. Nicole Hannah-Jones is a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter for The New York Times Magazine, the co-creator of The 1619 Project, and the founding director of the Center for Journalism and Democracy at Howard University. We always appreciate your time.